We've all been there before. You saved for a precious character, rolled on their banner, and lost the 50-50. Now you're out of primo gems, out of time, and out of hope to guarantee the character you want. But don't worry! In this definitive and comprehensive guide, I'll be teaching you how you can get all the way back to pity in just under a week. Stick around until the end of this video for additional advice, and don't forget to check the pinned comment if you have any questions. Also, please make sure you've completed the current Archon questline, because otherwise, this guide won't be all that helpful. But, with all of that out of the way, let's get started. Step 1. Shrines of Depths. You may have already seen these things before, but in case you haven't, there are tons of these scattered around each region. When unopened, they glow with a color based on the element of the region they're in. Each of them require a region-specific Shrine of Depths key, which you can get from completing world quests and clearing exploration domains. Unlocking the shrine gives you 40 primo gems and a few other useful items, and when you finally unlock every shrine for our respective region, you complete an achievement for an extra little bit of primo gems. The easiest way you can find them is by using an online interactive map which already has the locations marked. Keep in mind however that some shrines are located underground, so when you follow an interactive map, don't expect to see every shrine out in the open. You might need to look around for cave entrances every now and then. Oh, and this goes without saying, but you should also try to complete all of the exploration domains available in the game, as they give primo gems as well as keys for the shrines. If you're not sure what they look like, they're these diamond-shaped icons on your map with blue diamonds in their centers. Not to be confused with boss domains, which have the exact same icon. Also, when you click on them and check their description, there's a section that says Explore. Step 2. Events. If you have any events available to you right now, whether it's in-game or a special web event, be sure to check them out. The Primo Gem rewards can reach over a thousand with some events, and they can usually be crammed in a single day, so honestly, please never skip events. If you aren't eligible to participate in an event yet, like your adventure rank is too low, or you haven't been to a specific location that's required for it, do the main story quests, like the Archon questline, Inazuma Island questlines, character story quests, Whatever it takes to unlock the current event, do it, because completing those quests will also help you in the long term by unlocking new areas, gadgets, and quests. Step 3! Spiral Abyss Even if you don't think you're strong enough for it, you should definitely try to beat Spiral Abyss with as many stars as you can right now. The more stars you earn, the more rewards you can claim. And because Abyssal Moonspire takes two weeks to reset, you have a little bit of breathing room to get stronger between each round. With that in mind, please don't forget to spend your resin wisely and build strong teams so you're able to beat Spiral Abyss in the next cycle and get better rewards in the future. Step 4. Daily Tasks This should be obvious since everyone says it, but never skip your daily commissions. If you make sure to check in with Catherine after completing all four of them each day, that's 60 primo gems per day for minimal effort, so they are way worth doing. Apart from daily commissions, you should also pay attention to any recurring quests or activities that you can do every day to give you primo gems, such as the Neko quests in Azuma's Outsider Shrine and so on. If you're interested, I'd even recommend visiting the Grand Narukami Shrine to pull for fortune slips because it'll only take you a minute and if you're lucky, you can get an achievement from doing this that gives you 5 primo gems. Additionally, the Hoyo Lab website has a daily login system for Genshin Impact that gives you free loot every day, including 20 primo gems once in a while. This won't exactly help you with clutching, but if you didn't know about it until now, it's an awesome way to get extra primo gems and more per month for no effort at all. Step 5. Chest Hunting and Exploration If you haven't noticed, opening chests can actually give you primo gems. Depending on the rarity of the chest you open, the reward you get can range anywhere from 0 to 20 primo gems per chest, and there are hundreds of them scattered around the world. So now the question is, how do we get all of them as fast as possible? Well, let's start by choosing an ideal location. In terms of regional priority, it's best to start with Dragonspine first, then move to Inazuma, then Luya, then end with Mondstadt. This is because of what I call chest density. Out of all the current regions, Inazuma provides the most primo gems overall, due to its generous, common, and exquisite chests, as well as the fact that opening chests can give you electro sigils, which can be traded in later for bonus rewards. These factors place Inazuma miles ahead of Mondstadt and Luya in priority, however, Dragonspine is a unique exception. It has plenty of high-quality chests, despite being relatively small and simple to scout. 
Because of that, you can expect to get more Primo Gems in a shorter amount of time if you prioritize Dragonspine. Which is why in our list, Dragonspine is placed in a better spot than Inazuma, even though Inazuma rewards the most Primo Gems in total. That is chest density. You should think about this when selecting other areas as well. When you're finished with exploring one area, you need to choose the next one to explore based on the same principles. Luckily for us, the in-game map already gives us a simple way of estimating the chest densities of each area. If you zoom out on your map, you'll notice that every area is labeled by name and an exploration percentage. This measures not only the amount of chests you've opened, but also the amount of waypoints you've unlocked, oculi you've obtained, and so on. In other words, exploration percentage is a nice way of tracking how many primo gems you have left to scavenge from each area. Ideally, you'd want to have at least 96% exploration before moving to a new area, but realistically, 80% works just fine too. When it comes to choosing an area to explore though, make sure that the areas you prioritize have less than 70% exploration so that chests are easier to find. Remember, lower percentage means more abundant primo gems, so don't force yourself to 100% every area if your map still has plenty of low percents. Once you've picked out an area to explore, zoom in with your map, take a look around, and keep note of each sub-area within the area you chose. Some examples of sub-areas include the Dawn Winery, Chingsa Village, and Inazuma City, some of which are labeled, like the ones I just mentioned, while the rest you'll just have to mark yourself, like the Seirai Maru or Nameless Island. It's important to identify and isolate these major sub-areas so that we can be more thorough and explore them one at a time. A good example is Seirai Island, which is visibly separated into its different sub-areas already. You have a couple of the main locations which are marked by names and teleport waypoints, and then a few stray islands that were left unlabeled but are still clearly part of the area. If we explore each of these islands and sub-areas completely, we'll have 100%ed the entire area in a very comfortable and structured way. I should also note that by chunking the map this way, we're able to take notes and track our progress very easily as well. Anyways, now that you've picked a region, an area, and a sub-area, it's finally time to get into the nitty-gritty and assemble a good exploration team, the party that you'll be using to explore. Exploration teams need to be tailored to the region you're exploring. So for example, if you're exploring Dragonspine, you need to bring at least one Cryo character to activate monuments, and a Pyro character to melt ice or light fires. For Mondstadt, Lien, and Izuma, you obviously need Animo, Geo, and Electro respectively. I also highly suggest bringing a bow user for challenges, but if you want to make building teams easier, you can just swap in a bow user whenever you need to. Ideally speaking, exploration teams should also strike a balance between combat and movement, hence strong characters with good movement attributes are far better suited for exploration than others. Movement takes less of a priority over combat though, so don't worry if your character options are limited. And besides, you can always just use food to make life easier. Additionally, if combat really feels too tough for you or takes too long, you can always just lower your world level, but I highly discourage doing this because even though the Primo Gem rewards stay the same, opening chests at lower world levels gives you less valuable items. Once you've picked an exploration team, you can start scanning the surrounding area. Be on the lookout for chests, puzzles, secret entrances, anything really. Just remember to collect everything in a sub-area before advancing to the next. If you're having trouble knowing what to look out for, I have three simple tips for you. Tip 1. Even though it kinda sucks, you can use elemental sight to spot interactable objects. I personally don't like it, but I know it can be pretty efficient when used properly. Tip 2. If you've been doing your reputation quests, you may have unlocked the forging recipes for regional treasure compasses. These things are extremely handy, especially for beginner explorers or lazy people like me. Basically, when you activate one, it'll point you in the direction of a nearby chest and be on cooldown for a few seconds. If there are no chests nearby, the cooldown will be shorter, and the magic aura thing will disappear without pointing you in a direction. A slight downside to these is if you use them next to a wall, you might not be able to see where they're pointing. Also, they're only able to track chests that are out in the open and aren't allowed in Dragonspine apparently, so you can't rely on them to find everything, it's just more convenient if you have them with you. Tip 3! Use interactive maps. These things are honestly so helpful, they're practically a requirement for easy exploration. I've left links in the description to two that you can use, and they're pretty easy to understand. Just go to the left-hand side where the menu is and enable all of the essentials. Time challenges, oculi, waypoints, statues of the seven, all chest types, all puzzles, all that jazz, and you're set. All the locations of everything you need right at your fingertips. 
You can also enable Shrines of Depths if you haven't done that from step 1. It's all straightforward and extremely useful, but just note that you might need to search above or below you for certain things since the interactive maps don't really account for vertical positioning and should be used more as guides to know how many chests are in each sub-area rather than as another set of eyes. The more often you explore, the more you start to notice patterns, so don't worry if this all sounds confusing right now. The most important thing is that you're thorough and you keep your eyes peeled because some chests in Genshin are honestly really stupidly hidden. Something to keep in mind though, the map is your best friend. Your minimap can notify you of surrounding oculi, crimson agates, and other stuff like that, so don't forget to constantly check it or pay attention to the little ping sound it makes to know when one is nearby. Also, if you happen to get stuck on a puzzle or can't access a certain location, you can simply mark where you are on the map using pins so you can return there later on. That's another thing by the way, some locations in the game, especially in Inazuma, are blocked until you finish their respective world quests. So even though it takes a while, be sure to complete the world quests as you go along, especially quest lines, because those are usually what unlock the most locations. As an example, the Narukami area has its own special quest line called the Sacred Sakura Cleansing Ritual. Completing this quest line not only unlocks new small sub areas, but also gives you an item called the Memento Lens, which can be used to obtain chests and other rewards from Kitsune statues around the island. For a more extreme example, Watatsumi's Moonbathe Deep quest line literally unlocks an entire new area when completed, so yeah, keep an eye out for quest lines, and as a final Inazuma tip, Avoid exploring Surumi Island until you're done with everything else, since apart from the quest line, the chests that you get from there are pretty underwhelming. Half of them are remarkable chests which don't give primo gems, so honestly, you might even be better off maxing out Lia instead. When you're done exploring, don't forget to turn in any oculi and sigils that you have. With Inazuma in particular, electro sigils are actually important to turn in while exploring, since you won't be able to access certain places until your sacred sakura level is high enough. <sighs> that was a long one, but we're finally done. Moving on! Step 6. Achievements. Achievements are a perfect way to passively earn primo gems while exploring, so don't forget to keep checking the achievements menu for ones you're able to do. An achievement will usually give you 5 primo gems, although there are some that give 2, 10, or 20 depending on their importance. If this sounds familiar, that's because those are the same primo gem values that chests give, which is pretty cool. Also, if you want to go the extra mile, you can research all of the achievements in the Wonders of the World category because there are actually plenty of hidden achievements in the game that only appear in that category. Step 7. Stardust Conversion In the Paimon's Bargain Shop, there are two tabs you need to focus on. One that says Star Glitter and another that says Star Dust. If you have enough Star Glitter laying around, you can simply convert it all into intertwined fates for more wishes. The same applies for Stardust, but the Stardust shop is capped at only 5 intertwined fates per month. So here is where a little trick comes into play. Stardust and Star Glitter are obtained from wishing across any banner. So technically, you can obtain a quaint fates, wish on the perm banner, get Star Glitter as a reward, then convert that into intertwined fates. Essentially, through this process, you can recycle any acquaint fates that you have and turn them into intertwined. The best ways that you can obtain extra acquaint fates are through Character Ascension, the Frostbearing Tree, Sacred Sakura, Battle Pass, and the Adventurer's Handbook. Technically, there are other ways that you can obtain acquaint fates, but these are the best and most reliable for clutching because they're easy to get in short spans of time. Step 8. The Teapot. Little known fact, but the Serena Teapot can actually be a small source of passive primo gems. When you level up your trust rank, you get a small 60 primo gem reward each time. There are also plenty of achievements associated with the teapot, which is a nice bonus. But more importantly, you can complete special furnishing sets called companion sets that give you some rewards based on your friendship level with certain characters. Blueprints for the companion sets can be bought from the Realm Depot or unlocked by various means throughout the game. The Primo Gem rewards from here aren't anything crazy, but if you have enough characters and teapot resources laying around, there really isn't much of a reason that you shouldn't try it. Step 9. Hangout events. If you don't mind skipping through all the text and have the time for it, I would honestly suggest speedrunning all the hangout events that you've unlocked so far. Reaching every ending per hangout event gives you 60 primo gems, so if you need to cool off for a second or take a break from exploration, this is a pretty great way to do that. Step 10. Additional sources. Don't forget to check your mail whenever you see that red notification. 
If there's been some kind of update or server maintenance recently, you have a high chance of finding Primo gems stuffed into there. As mentioned earlier, don't forget to use the Hoyu Lab daily check-in system for extra stuff. There are also web events on Hoyu Lab sometimes, but you're usually informed of when this happens in-game anyway, so be sure to participate in every web event they offer, as you can get a handful of Primo gems from there as well. Lastly, be sure to keep an eye out for redeem codes. Occasionally, Mihoyo, or Hoyoverse, releases special gift codes which you can redeem on their Genshin Gift website. You might have seen these appear in Genshin ads on YouTube or the live-streamed version update programs, but basically, redeeming the codes will give you Primo Gems in your mail, which usually includes Primo Gems. And now for some final notes and considerations. Remember that with clutching, content is key. Because some of these tricks are one-time uses only, please keep in mind that you can only reliably clutch one or two characters per account. As more versions release, we'll have more opportunities to farm Primo Gems, but we can't expect every update to be amazing, so if you're an endgame player with 100% exploration, I wish you luck, but Genshin simply isn't designed to guarantee you multiple 5 stars as a free-to-play. The best you can do is log on every day, and continue working on Spiral Abyss and events so that you can save for future character reruns instead. In any case, I really hope this guide was helpful. Again, don't forget to check the pinned comment and join my Discord server if you have any more questions, but that's all the advice I've got for today. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you can support my upcoming videos, and cheers! I'll see you around.